Hey guys, welcome to Holt's June 2021 sale. They have got probably one of the best collections or breadth of choice of Holland & Holland shotguns and rifles anywhere at the moment. Possibly. 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 Maybe. But we, we have the full, almost the full range of what Holland & Holland produced over the years. One of the most industrious companies in the London gun trade, pioneers in marketing, um, has kept them at the top of the tree for, well, since, since the 1880s, really, 1870s, 1880s. So where did they start? Harris Holland started out as a maker and mender of musical instruments, funnily enough. Um, and that trade, uh, not being as strong as it might be, uh, he then moved into retailing tobacco. Just as a it's great another, business to be in, yeah, another string to his bow. Um, he obviously also had a, a passion for live pigeon shooting uh, in the 1850s, 60s, and he clearly was retailing tobacco to fellow live pigeon shots, and they might have been talking about guns because he started building muzzle loading live pigeon guns uh, and selling them, and that is how he graduated towards the gun trade. When you say he he had men to do, he wasn't a gun maker himself. He was a skilled man in making and mending all kinds of different machinery. So he, he may have actually uh, done some of the making himself, but then he started recruiting people as the business took off. He, like all really good businessmen, hired sound people around him uh, and the best in the trade to come and build uh, or put together some of the guns as well. He was buying in parts from Birmingham um, and, scra and putting their name on the action uh, and on the lot plates, um, Harris Holland or and H Holland. And London. And London, uh, and selling them on. Uh, and that they did. Holland and Holland uh, were, this for example is a very early Holland Royal, um, and that was a Webley action uh, finished in London. And the, the early Royals of this period, which is about 1880, had that dipped edge lot plate. They're not stocked to the fences. Um, but it's, it, it, Hollands weren't the only ones doing it. Everybody in the London trade was struggling to keep up with demand from clients. It was huge business. Wow. And the only people who could supply enough of the raw materials, barreled actions in the white, were the Birmingham trade, particularly Webley and also Scott, who then joined forces to become Webley and Scott. Just because they were churning out such quantity. Because of bigger units. Yeah, they had vast numbers of gun makers up in Birmingham um, who were making enough to satisfy the huge demand in London. But Hollands didn't begin by building, they didn't found their reputation on shotguns. Which is strange because that's pretty much what they're known for now. It is, but actually in the early days, and the genius of the marketing brain that Harris Holland possessed was their foundation was built on rifles. So rifles like this, every, every gun maker was building rook rifles, every gun maker of note, um, but Holland's built a reputation for building more accurate rifles than anyone else. This coincided with uh, the editor of the field at the time who organized trials to see who had the most accurate rifles. And Harris Holland's second stroke of genius was hiring a man from Hampshire who was built like a proverbial brick outhouse called William G. Froome. William Froome was a fantastic rifle shot and he had the frame and the pictures of him, well, you will see the shoulders on this man. He had the frame to shoot 500 double nitro rifles all his life without any serious debilitating effects. He was a vast individual, but he was also capable of putting together some fantastic groups in these trials. And Holland's in those trials uh, that were, took place in the, in the 1870s, 1880s, Holland's won all of the prizes, all of them. That was partly because they were building extremely accurate rifles, but also that they had the guy who was one of the best rifle shots in the country. Yeah. Um, Froome, Similar marketing strategy yeah, what people absolutely. do now. Right? They'll yeah. build a good gun, yeah. and then they get the best people in the world to shoot it, and yep. not and much has changed. No, not much has yeah. changed. And you know, they were also retailing um, cheaper guns for use out in the colonies in Africa and India. Yeah. This is you know, their 375 flanged. Uh, by Holland and Holland, but did, it's not built by Holland. Did they have like an export grade then, or is it? Yeah, their grades did vary. Um, it's it was their main problem was keeping up with demand. Um, they built their first factory in in the in the eighty, I think it was the early eighteen eighties, and then almost only ten years later, they had to build a second factory because the late seventies, early eighties, uh, their their business just went through the roof, and they were they were selling six seven hundred guns a year, which was unheard of. So their order books were full, and they rode the quest of that wave to reinvest in the business, hire more gun makers, hire better machinery, 
um, you know, the proper gas turbine in the basement that drove all the belts and pulleys that, that drove all these machines to, to build these guns. And it wasn't until the late 1880s that they started making all of their guns in-house. So yeah, their, their reputation was founded on rifles um, and the accuracy of their rifles and they used different actions uh, to satisfy different clients' needs all over the world. Um, but it was principally based on marketing rifles for people to hunt and to take out. For bolt, bolt actions or doubles as well? Originally? Doubles as well. We, that's the one thing we don't actually have in this sale is any example of a double rifle, uh, sadly. Um, but they were making, yeah, they, some of their patents involve bolstering the side locks of the actions. Their, their double rifles are back action side locks. Mm -hmm. They're not bar action side locks too, because having a, on a big double rifle, having any metal removed from there weakens that point of the gun, yeah. which is subject to huge stresses when you start pushing out very, very large caliber bullets for elephant and rhino and big game. So the, the, all the working parts are on the back of the lock plate for a back action. And then they later on, I think it was after the turn of the century, they started bolstering their actions to increase the strength as well. So, I mean, they were very, very inventive. They have lots of patents to their name. So in that period that they were getting good, the 70s, 1880s and 1870s, mm. that was that real steep yeah. change in gun making. And they were leading that as much as anyone else? Yes, they were. Um, the, the patents were flowing you know, fast from, from Harris Holland um, and his relatives who started to join the business with him as well uh, and, and would eventually take over from him. Uh, and the, the family relationship wasn't always sweetness and light. No family is no. <laughs> but um he was i mean he was a, a dynamic guy he really was so yeah he he drove the marketing he hired the right people and he built holland into well it went from holland to holland and holland and then later holland and holland limited as they at what point did it change to holland and holland when he took his son when or? henry holland joined the yeah joined the firm to to become the sort of heir apparent for the business as i understand nice so when it comes to the shotguns Again, you see Holland's marketing flair at this time. Um, their early design royals, built for them, as I say, in Birmingham, later became redesigned into, and you can see the various different grades as they move on to a rounded edge lock plate rather than a dipped edge lock plate. Was that just a stylistic choice at the time that this was probably in fashion when this was done and this was fashioned thereafter? Or is yeah. this a, that's yeah. what Webley offered? It's probably what was on offer. Um, and then the quality control, they wanted to, they wanted consistency over the years. And then they, when they brought the design in house, they started making the lock plate as we know lock plates look now. Um, so not much has changed from this later version of the Holland Royal uh, until the modern versions that, that we see today. So the, the engraving, the maker's name on the escutcheon, that has changed subtly. Um, but other than that, and, if, and other patents like single triggers and self-opening mechanisms, they come later on. But the basic design of the Holland Royal has not changed in 120 years and has been copied all over the world because it's so successful. And that's a copy of aesthetics as well as internal working mechanisms? Yes. Pretty good. It right. is. Must be pretty annoying for Holland and Holland. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you can imagine their their success. I mean, they, like like a lot of these best gun makers, they are victims of their own success because these things are very very difficult to wear out. Um, yes, the barrels do suffer over 120 years worth of use, and they get thinner. Um, but actually, well maintained, these things go on forever. So we have got this Holland Royal, the Holland. Was always the Royal? Was that name designated to the side lock as soon as they changed it to this design? Yeah, it's again, it's part of their marketing. You know, calling something Royal appeals to a certain sector of society that they were trying to sell guns to, you know, gentlemen of leisure with money. So, and who were, you know, trying to keep up with the fashions of, of the Royal household who were passionate about their game shooting. Uh, but they weren't always Royals. No, they, the Hollands, again, they marketed well to different layers of society. So on top of selling the, the Holland Holland Royal that we all know and love, they also sell, sold a number two grade side lock, uh, which I have to say is probably my favorite because of the slightly understated engraving. It's just a, an elegant gun. This one isn't stocked to the fences, um, as you can see. And stocked to the fences means that you just have a flat bar. Actually. Yes, exactly. I mean, you, the, the top horn does not go all the way up to the detonator there, um, that being the fence there. So it's just the phrase that we use for, for when an action looks There's like no that. negative side to that. It's no, just it's not. It's very strong. classy gun yeah, making. Yeah, it, exactly. It's just less refined. Uh, on, on further on from the number two, they also offered a number three grade, which is a back action lock plate. Um, so a very strong bar 
Uh, very strong, very durable gun, less money than these two. Um, and they were popular in their time as well. And actually, one of the uh, most well-known people uh, from Holland and Holland, David Winks, was very fond of Dominions. So later, they later called them Dominions, but the, the number three grade, because the balance on them was very good, very solid, very durable gun, very, very good value. Yeah, the, the working man's Holland and Holland. Yeah. And da it. David's been uh, a barrel maker for Holland and Holland since 1955, I think, and has, you know, uh, and retired as a director of the firm. And he was, he always was very fond of these number three grades. They later on were marketed in the 1930s. Obviously, circumstances changed between the wars. The wars were ruinously expensive for economies and the Great Depression in America virtually wiped out Holland's market in America in the 30s. So they didn't sit on their hands and go, woe is me. They sat around the boardroom table and went, we've got to do something about this. What are we going to do? And they, they went heavy on the marketing strategy. And they renamed the number three the Dominion to appeal to the colonies. Because it's still classy. Because it's still classy, yeah. It's still classy. It's got that royal... Exactly. Sort of thing going on. Yeah. So, and later on, they, they began in the 50s, they offered a box lock with Holland and Holland as well, built in Birmingham, finished in London again. Is there any, there's nothing wrong with that inherently. No. It's just a good way, same as many people use Spain or Italy today. It's a yes. similar sort of concept. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and everyone's your honest. Were they honest about it? I presume they're pretty open about that. Yeah, they, they didn't say um, made by Holland and Holland on the rifles, they said shot and regulated by. Um, like so, the new speed. Yeah, and yeah. the cheaper the cheaper box locks, and they, they were trying to appeal to a market. They were shot and regulated by Holland and Holland. Nice. So, or H and H sometimes is on the on the box lock actions as well. Um, but uh, yeah, there was there was no shame in that. I mean, there there wasn't a single gun making firm that wasn't doing that. Finishing guns made in Birmingham, they were all doing it. So, is a royal just a royal, a royal, a royal? Because in front of us, these are all royals. Yeah, no, they developed over time. As we've seen the, the 1880 Royal develop into the, the classic lock plate that we know um, and into this style of Holland Royal. After this style of Holland Royal, Hollands did not sit on their hands again. They constant invention from Henry Holland. He, was, he had, I think, 22 patents to his name by the time he died. The hand detachable lock plate, the lever which you can see on these three guns here, was simply there so that sportsmen could take the lock plates off, clean the inside after a, a very wet day in the field without using a turn screw. Turn screws disappeared from the cases and the hand detachable lock plate was included. Because they nice didn't move. Hollands were thinking about the sportsman burring the edge off the screw, as we often see when, when amateur hands get um, a turn screw it's in their hands. Very easy to lose it a turn very, screw. Yeah, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to cock up a screw head. And and this was a simple solution. It is uh, nice. And it's it's a stroke of genius, really. Is it's amazing just how to you put can that put a patent on that, isn't it? Yeah, and I don't know if any of these have got patent written on, but the early ones had patent written on the actual lever. Um, and this is where the the grades and the custom design, the requests from clients, then yeah. start to so increase. So this is their house style. House style, yeah, with that sort of Art Deco um, acanthus scroll work. And then you move on into uh, a preter engraved game scene engraving on the lock plate, including the house style as canthus scroll work as well. Um, this is an exception because that's a royal brevis, which is again what is a royal brevis. Royal brevis was there was a fashion uh, after people realised that they didn't need thirty inch barrels uh, to make black powder work. Black powder morphed into cordite and then nitro. Shorter barrels came into fashion because you didn't need the extra length of barrel to. In to make sure that there was enough burn time for the powder to get up to pressure to drive your shot. With nitrocellulose uh, powder, um, shorter barrels came into fashion. And uh, instead of uh, Holland saying, oh, well, this is our short barrel gun, they called it the Royal Brevis because it's a marketable name. Again, they're always thinking about their marketing. What does Brevis mean? Brevis, Latin for short. Wow, there you go. That's pretty easy, isn't <laughs> That's it? all it is. Wow. So, and then we move on into the very highest grade that Holland's offer which, and still do, which is their model deluxe. This is the zenith of Holland Holland gun making with carved detonators, beautiful flowing acanthus leaf and stunning woodwork. Everything that Holland and Holland can do to make a best gun they've done here, including one of their later patents that they're also famous for, their self-opening mechanism, which is a spring housed in there that forces the barrels down. And it, its advantage over other self-opening mechanisms is it doesn't, that is not involved in recocking the mechanism at all. All it is there for is opening the barrels quickly. Because some 
self openers Some others are extremely yeah, inc- difficult to close. Exactly, they're after very difficult to close. Recall, yeah. Although there is a famous story that um, when one client complained that a particular brand of gum was quite hard to close, he was told that his loader closes it for him. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, as people who are more in the loading department than yes. the shooting department, I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. But yeah, so this is the this is the the e- gradual evolution of Holland and Holland's side lock, uh, the Royal and the Royal Brevis and other derivations of first-class London guns. And they are still available today. Yes, they are. All right, how much, the, the how long is a piece of string question, how much should one spend on a Holland & Holland? It very Let's much... A royal with the house style. So a nice, simpler thing with half-decent barrels and intact woodwork. Yeah, a hammer price of eight to 10,000 pounds gets you a good one. Um, okay. Obviously, you have to factor in uh, commission uh, on top of that. Uh, our commission is twenty five percent plus VAT. Um, but certainly, uh, there are there are a number, as you can see here, there are a number now coming to market that that we haven't seen before. Um, and it is you know, it is now a buyer's market. You can get a very very high quality gun for for not huge money. Given that new, there what one hundred and fifty somewhere there. Yes, ballpark. depending on customizable options and oh, special requests. It's a bit like going getting a car, isn't exactly. it? You are just going to. Yeah, I'll yeah. have that. And if you go in and they show you this, you're going to want, you want, the, they want the carving. Um, yeah, I think I want the carving. I don't want the extended trigger. Yeah, and I, want, and I want a rolled yeah. edge trigger guard, and I want a single trigger, and all of your clever yes, patents, and please, apply. Yes, £200,000 yeah. before and you know it. Exactly. So 8 to 10 seems fairly fair. It is reasonable, actually. Why are some three grand? That will be principally down to the condition. Um, okay. Barrel condition, most of all. Uh, if they're very thin, uh, if they're borderline out of proof, we obviously are not allowed to sell out of proof guns, but if they if they are coming close to becoming out of proof, um, then that's an indication of, of how much wear they've had. Uh, but it's also stock condition as well, uh, pitting and rust and general um, mm. damage from use and abuse. So if you know what you're doing, maybe take, not the risk, but you can buy very wisely and do fix those problems yourself, but your average person, it probably is wiser to if you see a three grand Holland to go, it's probably not for me. It depends. I mean, if you, you know, if you factor in the repairs that are required, um, then there are some bargains to be had. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, finding one with original colour like this and this Royal Brevis here, you know, these are these are the much sought after ones because they they have seen less use um, as they become. Yeah, my favourite, to be honest with you, I'm, I actually prefer it when this colour is worn slightly to this sort of storm cloud grey. Yeah. That is my preferred look. That is just honest age, that's, but that's me, everyone's different. Um, so yeah, don't be, don't be put off too much, but yeah, we're here to answer those questions. If you, if you think it's you know, too good a value, then ask the question why, and we will send you a full condition report as to you know, what's wrong with it. So the Royal Brevis, is that worth more or less than a standard Royal? Uh, they, they're a little bit, they tend to be a little bit less because the shorter barrels are not as in vogue as longer barrels. 28 and 30 especially are still these days popular because we're getting taller, because people want longer barrels, because they are, you know, someone six foot or over, which lots of us are these days because of our diet has, has got better over the years. We've got taller as a species. Um, people don't like shorter barrels because of that. They find them too whippy because we've got longer levers swinging them. Our yeah, arms are bigger. Seems fair. I would <laughs> so, feel like a toothpick in yeah, exactly. my hands. I can't shoot a 25 inch gun. Yeah, that's definitely the next thing we're going <laughs> to shoot together. <laughs> <laughs> Why not out of interest? Just because it's too erratic for it, the modern style of shooting. I, I'm, what, why can't I shoot a 25 inch? Yeah. I, it's just, I find it far, far too whippy. Uh, okay. And I get through the target, f- uh, the bird far quicker than I should and I stop. So we've changed our bodies, but our the shoot the style of shooting perhaps has changed too. Yeah, uh, the 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 shorter barrows were very much in vogue, um, driven by Robert Churchill, uh, another gun making famous gun making house. Oh, I mean, he competed two successfully. Five inch of his guns over yeah. there. Alle- yeah, exactly. Allegedly, he had an accident on his way to a live pigeon match in Monte Carlo and had to cut five inches off his barrel, and then went out and shot the best of his life and realised that actually you could shoot short barrels if you had the right style. But it's a very fast, very instinctive way of shooting and it's not very often taught these days. And to do it well, your technique has to be absolutely sound. Your gun mount has to be perfect to do that well. Okay, that makes sense. So this will be, well, 20% cheaper than a sound and hollow. Arguably, but again, it comes down down to condition. Condition as much as anything and how many people want to buy that one. Yes. 
that is a particularly nice example of a Rob Revis. It is very nice. It's very nice. I must be that game team one is probably my favourite on the yeah. table. Yeah, it is absolutely That's stunning. That's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Ben. If Holland Holland couldn't crack a good game scene, <laughs> there might be an issue in the world. Yeah, quite. Thank you very, very much. My um, pleasure. It's been fascinating, actually. Absolutely fascinating. And, and any excuse to look at absolutely beautiful guns. Yes. No, oh, it's a pleasure to talk about them. They are, I mean, they continue to produce some of the nicest guns ever built.